Let me start with uh, Daniel Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize in Winner in Economics, and Professor at Princeton. Um, and he wrote this book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which is, to a large extent, about dual process theory. Um, He's not the originator of the idea, William James, um, started it in 1890 and so on. Many people have talked about it since then. It basically, the idea is that brains use two different modes of thinking. And one is an intuitive understanding, and another one is logical reasoning. And if you look at some characteristics of those two, um, understanding is fast and reasoning is slow, hence the title of the book. Um, and understanding gets its speed from being mostly parallel, and reasoning is, of course, step by step when you go through a chain of propositions or whatever. Understanding is intuitive, and reasoning is logical. Understanding is subconscious, and reasoning is conscious, very conscious. Understanding is involuntary, and reasoning is voluntary. We can look at several of these two um, and basically examine them from a research point of view, but the last one is actually very nice because we can do a little thought experiment and um, convince ourselves that dual process theory is correct. Imagine you're planning a European vacation and you can basically, you want to nail down which sites you want to see, which cities you want to go to, um, what hotels to sleep at, train schedules or whatever. And you start this process takes a long time, you have a cup of coffee, you can get back to it, you can break for continue the next day, whatever. So reasoning can be stopped and continued. It's voluntary. Whereas understanding, such as understanding how to sequence the leg muscles as you walk across the floor, how to understand things that you see in your visual field, understand language, is instantaneous and involuntary. And once you learn to understand English, you cannot turn it off. This is enough to convince me that dual process theory is correct. So if we look at reasoning and understanding as a conscious and a subconscious part, it's pretty clear to me that, that basically reasoning is on top of the understanding. And we can look at the evolutionary record, we can look at animals like dogs. Um, they, don't, they understand a lot, but they don't reason much. It's also clear to me and many others that the role of reasoning has been exaggerated. Can we get an, ex an estimate of how much? We can look at the incoming bandwidth from the eyes, for instance, about 10 megabits per second. But multiple psychological studies have shown that we are only consciously aware of about 100 bits per second. That's a factor of 100,000 to one. So what's happening in the, in the understanding part is basically that we have a data reduction and an epistemic reduction so that only the most important information makes it up to the top. That what matters. That's what saliency means. So brains spend only about 0.001% of their cycles on the reasoning part. So rightly, reasoning is just a paint-thin layer on top of our understanding. In the 20th century, artificial intelligence research was overly concerned with the reasoning part, almost to the exclusion of everything else. And now it's time to take a look at the understanding part, and that's what artificial intuition is all about. That's my research. So in case you missed it, AI research has been working on the wrong problem. And that's why we're not making any headway. Now, why did we do that? Well, it's easy to get learned by what I call the greatest invention our species has ever made. It's reductionism, the use of models. That's what all, most of science rests on that. Models are theories, equations, um, hypotheses, scientific models, naive models, and computer programs. They are all simplifications of our rich reality. We take our rich reality, which is too complex to s enter into your calculator, and we strip away that which is irrelevant, um, that's what we think of as not being salient, and we get end up with something very small, which is a model which is simple enough to attack with your slide rule or your computer. And reasoning requires models of this kind. We, all the reasoning we do uses these kinds of models. So AI researchers, they just started modeling the world back in the 50s. 
and many, many famous projects have basically been doing nothing but. But unfortunately, comprehensive world models are impossible. You can make models of small chunks of the world, but you can't make models of the entire world. Um, there is a conflict between how much you want to model and how much you can handle. And we had hints that this was impossible as long as, as in 1969 when John McCarthy and Pat Hayes published a paper about the frame problem. The frame problem briefly states that the world changes behind your back. So that any comprehensive world model that you make is immediately obsolete. And if you rely on that for doing something, uh, you are going to make mistakes. So AI research has been traditionally done in limited domains, small problems, toy problems. And they only seem to work because they have, we have reduced the problem before we start to something that we can handle. And logic reasoning and models of the world cannot be used as a base for artificial general intelligence. We can build systems where that is the result, but we can't use it at the bottom level, at the implementation level. Some consequences. And this is a little bit beyond dual process theory. This is some of my own thinking. Let's look at the properties of a possible AGI. A possible as opposed to an impossible one. An impossible one is the kind that we tried to do for 60 years, 65 years. All intelligent agents are fallible. This follows directly from the frame problem. You can't always be right. The world changes behind your back. So we can only do best effort given the available information. All intelligence are also limited. I mean, what would an unlimited intelligence be? It would be something that's always right, uh, always correct. And we just said that was impossible. So there's hard limits on intelligence. And the limits are imposed by world complexity. They're not technological. We don't know what the maximum possible intelligence is. We don't know what the maximum possible um, precision of prediction is for various time frames. Um, I have this conviction, if you will, that it's not going to be significantly over what humans are. We are reasonably optimal for our environment. Because self-improvement has limits uh, for the same reasons. Uh, you try to, computer tries to improve itself. After a while, it's going to start introducing bugs and corner cases, and we're going to get this fractal bug and corner case uh, addition to our improved system. We can't always be right. This means that our popular popular ideas about AGA may be incorrect. Things like infallible omniscient, Im infallible, omniscient, superhuman, godlike AGI is totally impossible. Unfriendly AI is therefore not a problem because all intelligence are fallible. If we have somebody, some AI that tries to take over the world, we just make it until it makes a mistake and then we pull the plug on it. Also, spectacular AI singularity is unlikely. We will see slowly increasing intelligences uh, of this kind, but they are fallible and so on. They, we get plenty of decades of time to learn how to deal with them, how to manage them. I like to say that they're going to start out with the intelligence that roughly at level teenagers, and we know how to handle teenagers. <laughs> so beyond popular ideas, our technologies that we use today for AGI may be incorrect. We use these for AI, for, for limited domain artificial intelligence, like uh, whatever. But if you want to do in general intelligence, the technologies that we're used to uh, using today and that are still taught at our schools are likely not the correct ones. Because they incorrectly assume that intelligence is based on reasoning. Even our definitions for AGI may be incorrect. A popular definition is the ability of a computer or other machine to perform those human activities that are normally thought to require intelligence. But this means that we basically take the most difficult things that humans do and think this is intelligence, like playing chess or solving an integral or, um, I don't know, searching and sorting. Computers do all of these things already, and we don't think that that's AI. Something is wrong here, and I like to claim the opposite. I like to say that a good, better definition for, for AGI would be the ability of a computer to do those human activities that are normally thought not to require intelligence. That's how wrong these definitions are. Doing what we do without thinking has to be the first step towards AGI. Things like how do you sequence your leg muscle walking across the floor? 
How do you speak? How do you listen? How do you understand language? How do you generate language? How do you understand the visual input? How do you enjoy a symphony? These are things that computers cannot do. But that's the kind of stuff we have to start with. So some AI strategies model the world, as I said, what we've been doing so far, mostly. That's called reductionist artificial intelligence, because it uses models. We can model the brain, that's becoming popular, but, uh, and that's basically neuroscience-inspired AI. But our precision in volume and in time domain are too bad, too low, and it's going to take a decade or so before we get to anything useful. So I have a third proposal, which is that we model uh, understanding itself. And we can call that epistemological AI. We start basically from ground principles, fun fundamental principles of epistemology. What is learning? What is knowledge? How can we learn things? How can we learn anything at all? And so on. What is reasoning really? How do we anchor the variables that we use for reasoning? The AGI itself has to make its own models. We can call this machines capable of autonomous reduction. That's a technical <coughs> term that I come up with. This. The reduction is the process of taking the rich world and reducing it down to a model. But the shorter and more catchy phrase would possibly be understanding machines. So I'm talking about creating understanding machines rather than artificial general intelligence because it is tainted with this reductionist flavor. How do we proceed to do that? We have to use what's called model-free methods. I'll explain why. Reasoning requires models. We said that earlier. Model making and reuse requires understanding. You have to understand your problem domain um, before you can determine what is salient, what is important, what is worth keeping, what is worth learning, what can be thrown away. You can't make those decisions unless you understand the problem domain. So understanding has to come first. Understanding must precede models. Therefore, understanding must be implemented without using models. You don't have them yet. At that level, you don't have them. And it also follows the evolutionary record. Understanding has to precede reasoning, and it did. In most species, don't reason as much as we do. So, uh, therefore, understanding requires model-free methods. The model-free methods, there's about 14 of them. I list them in my website. I can talk about them in the QA if you want. But these model-free methods, they provide learning, salience, reduction, abstraction, novelty, and emergent robustness, among other things. And these are things that you cannot, for love of money, make using reductionist systems, using <coughs> um, logic. Novelty, for instance, there's very, very few papers in AI community about how to do no useful novelty. But that comes very e easily in model-free methods. Let's look at some characteristics between model-based and model-free methods. As I said, model-based methods they require understanding, whereas model-free methods do not. It's a very compelling thing to have if you're going to build an artificial intelligence that you don't actually have to understand things when you start. Uh, it's the understanding is emergent in the system. Model-based methods, they discard context as a nuisance to get rid of it, to get down to this model. Whereas Model-free methods, they exploit context for disambiguation and other purposes. Model-free methods are provably correct if you do it right. Of course, we don't always know that we're doing it right. We can pick the wrong model. We can ignore important parts. We want to do something like use a F equals MA, and we forget about friction. We made a reduction error. A lot of our errors are reduction errors. On the other hand, model-free methods are often fallible. That was part of the problem. They all happens to be more expensive also. So that's not, we don't want to use model-free methods if we have a model-based solution that works. For almost all purposes, if you can use the reductionist way, use model-based methods, there's only a couple of places where you go to the model-free ones, and that is artificial general intelligence for one reason, and certain domains like in instance genomics where the complexity is too high and you have no choice. Model-based methods, they require correct input data. If you're logic-based, you better have correct data because otherwise you're just going to draw the wrong conclusions because logic is like relentless. Errors go right through it. But model-free methods, because they're heavily redundant, it's part of why they're so expensive, 
they operate even on scant evidence. And redundance also means that the uh, lack of redundance on the left means that uh, model based methods are brittle. When they reach the edge of the model, edge of their competence, they fail in spectacular ways. That's what brittleness in AI has been. It's been a, a problem for AI since the beginning. And the model based methods, sorry, model free methods, because of their redundancy, etc., are robust against errors, um, lies, misinformation, etc., missing information. So the greatest surprise to AGI researchers is that they need to create computer programs that jump to conclusions on scant evidence. Some more characteristics between understanding and reasoning. We said understanding uses intuition as the algorithm, whereas reasoning uses logic as the algorithm. We use understanding in everyday life. Almost everything we do, like I said, walk across the floor, uses intuition and understanding as its base and experience. We're using reasoning mostly in science, but even there, even a scientist standing in front of a blackboard trying to solve an integral how do they know what to do next, which substitution to use, whatever? They use their intuition, their understanding of the problem to pick the next substitution. The mere scribbling of symbols is logic. Again, it's a paint-thin layer on top of your understanding of the problem domain. So in everyday life, we use understanding for trivial problems in complex contexts. Life is complex, the world is complex. But we can make easy decisions like which muscle to contract next, or more high level, um, suppose you are given the opportunity to go teach at the University of Heidelberg for two years, should I do it or not, yes or no? And that's a very trivial problem and the context is very complex. <coughs> Hundreds of variables matter. <coughs> and, uh, and in contrast, reasoning and science, they solve complicated problems, big equations, but they do it in a trivial context which is basically done after we've already done the reduction to something simple. So rocket science sounds complicated. Its mass is flowing through vacuum, OK? <laughs> and we can make a graph of that. We can plot problem complexity as against context complexity. And up here in the corner, we have what we call the absurd region. This is problems that are too complex in a context that, are, that is too complex, so we can't solve those. But we can do things when we stay closer to the axis. And down here we have logical, re uh, up here we have intuitive understanding, and down here we have logical reasoning. And here is rocket science, here is language. Down here we have something like pool balls. You can view collisional pool, pool balls as collisional spherical ob elast el elastic spherical objects under maintaining of momentum, conservation of momentum. Or you can go downtown and shoot some pool, intuitively. So you can use both kinds of methods in many situations. So here, either when one way work, here reasoning outperforms understanding, and over here, understanding outperforms reasoning. So reduction in science lives down here and use these model-based methods. And we can see here how the artificial intelligence toy problems that we had, they are under this line here. We have solved the AI toy problems using these methods, but we think they're real AI problems, but they're not. So when you, they don't scale. When you want to go from there to here, unless you're using the model-free methods, you can't do it. You're going to be stuck at this line here. So all the simple AI successes that we've had over the years, for reductionist science, for rule-based system, for logic, even Bayesian logic, all of these things have been, uh, basically they have been false promises because they are actually in unable to get into the real AI. So science solves difficult problems in trivial context using logical reasoning. Humans solve trivial problems in complex contexts using intuitive understanding. And if you want to progress in AI, we have to get to artificial use artificial intuition thank you